Hey everyone, welcome to a brief history of the potter's wheel. There's a lot to go over here, so I'm not going to ask you to take full notes the way we normally would. However, I do want you to have your notebook in front of you, and I want you to jot down anything that you find interesting about the history or some of the personalities who use a pottery wheel to make their art. There is going to be a short quiz at the end of this video, and that quiz is going to be your daily assignment. So you will not have to photograph your notes today. However, I do still want you to jot down anything that I say that you find kind of interesting about the pottery wheel. Okay, grab your notebook and here we go. <laughs> All right, first, what is a potter's wheel? A potter's wheel is a device that helps in shaping a cylindrical pot. It, people have always been able to make cylindrical pots, but a pottery wheel allowed people to make cylindrical pots better and more efficiently. It's a form of ancient technology that's still in use today by potters. The first pottery wheel was actually not a wheel. The very first known use of a device that functions like a potter's wheel was a leaf or a mat placed underneath a pot that was being coil built. The evidence of this lies in the leaf's impressions left in the clay at the base of the pot. This arrangement allowed the potter to rotate the vessel during construction rather than walk around it to add coils of clay. We're going to watch a short video now of a modern Indian woman uh, from India making a pot using something that's similar to what these first pots would have used. This is not a leaf that she's building on. It's a, a, a clay disc that she's made. But if you watch, she's going to be coil building and the disc that her pot is sitting on allows her to spin that pot and apply the coil more, fit, more quickly and efficiently. So you can see now how that disc is really helping her spin the pot. And all she has to do is hold that little wet rag up on the rim or the lip of the pot. And as long as she's steady with how she's holding her hand up at the rim of the pot, and as long as she spins the pot at the bottom, it allows her to shape that pot much more quickly. So the first actual fast wheel was uh, comes to us from Mesopotamia around 3000 BC. This fast wheel was developed on the principle of the flywheel. It utilized energy stored in a rotating heavy stone wheel. This wheel was wound up and charged with energy by kicking or by pushing it with a stick, which provided centrifugal force. The big technolo technological advance in this fast wheel was that potters could now produce many more pots per hour, which was a first step toward industrialization. So this is a modern day potter in Iran, and he is using the same or basically the same technology that was used thousands of years ago using a flywheel, which you'll see he'll wind up using a stick. And as he's making this pot, I'm going to talk you a little bit through the steps that he's going through, because these are the same steps you're going to use when you start working on the pottery wheel next week. So first he's centering the clay just with his hands. Now he's using the stick and spinning that flywheel, which must weigh hundreds of pounds, spinning it to a speed where it's going to maintain its own uh, velocity through its sheer weight. So he's going to spin that wheel and now he's going to start applying water and now he's going to wet center the clay. He's using his hands to stabilize the side and the top. Now he's using his thumbs to dig a well in the middle of the pot so that this pot will end up being hollow. Now he's raising the walls bringing those hollow pot walls taller and taller. 
he's going to end up making a large bottle form uh, similar to the ones that you see behind him. You can see all those bottles, uh, all those jugs and jars are the same shape, the same size, and that consistency and the speed that would have allowed that many pots to have been made uh, was all thanks to this first fast wheel. So now he's shaping his pot by either pushing out from the inside or in from the outside to bring the walls out where he wants them to get fatter, to bring the walls in where he wants them to get more narrow. You can see the wheel is still going pretty fast. He hasn't needed to stop and get it going again. He's shaping that pot simply by applying steady pressure with his hands. And you'll see once you use the pottery wheel, how important it is to be very slow and very steady and very deliberate with your hands. The ancient Egyptians were also known to have developed an early type of potter's wheel. In fact, the whole reason that we know that uh, the ancient Egyptians were potters was because of some of their hieroglyphics included pictures of um, some of their deities making human forms on the pottery wheel. They believed that their deity Kanum was said to have formed the first humans on a potter's wheel. So skip ahead now to 1590. Um, uh, in 1590, there was a, an event going on called the Ceramic Wars. And during the Ceramic Wars, Japan was at war with China and Korea. And during this, the, China, the Ceramic Wars, Japanese soldiers kidnapped skilled Korean potters and other artisans. These kidnapped potters taught their captors how to use the potter's wheel to make beautiful thin walled vases with ornate glazed designs like the one you see in this picture. And the partnership that, that grew out of those potters that taught the, the Korean potters that taught the Japanese potters uh, really created um, a ceramic dynasty in China, Korea, and Japan for many, many years. And in fact, um, China was one of the only places where uh, this very fine white type of clay called porcelain could be found. And um, back uh, in this very early era of the 1500s, only uh, China knew or, or had access to this porcelain. And so it, if there was a time where porcelain, this white clay, was worth more than gold because it was so precious. So for many, many years, these Asian cultures really dominated the ceramics world. So now flash forward to the modern age. Uh, you're gonna learn now about a Minnesotan master potter named Warren McKenzie. I have a couple different tributes to him in my classroom. So if you are um, paying attention, you'll see a few different references to Warren McKenzie in my room. And uh, I'm gonna tell you about Warren McKenzie because not only is he a Minnesotan potter, not only is he world famous and has pots and museums all across the world, um, but because he is a particular idol of mine. I very much look up to this man. Um, I was lucky enough to take some of my students out to visit him for about 10 years when he was still maintaining his pottery in Stillwater, uh, Minnesota. And he's passed recently. He passed uh, two years ago, unfortunately. But Warren was a powerhouse in the world of contemporary ceramics. And he learned everything from, uh, from the Japanese. So uh, Warren uses a Japanese style of wheel called a treadle wheel, which you're going to see in a moment. I'm going to play you a video of Warren making pots. So he uses a Japanese wheel called a treadle wheel, and he learned how to use that wheel and how to make pots from a British potter named Bernard Leach from England. And he, Bernard learned how to make pots using a, a treadle wheel from Shoji Hamada a master potter from Japan. So the world of ceramics is really just one big community where everybody kind of just shares and learns from each other, even all the way back to the ceramic wars where the, the Japanese potters learned from the Korean potters. 
So Warren brought all his skills that he learned from England and from Japan to Minnesota. And he was a ceramics professor at the U of M for many, 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 many years. And he influenced generations of potters who went on to become very successful potters uh, professionally in their own right. So Warren McKenzie is the whole reason why Minnesota is seen as a very strong, very well-known uh, place for potters to live and work and sell their pots. So let's watch a little video of Warren making pots at the place where he learned to make pots at the Leech Pottery in England. <laughs> I thought I'd just start out and make, make pots the way I do. And if you have any questions, speak up and, and ask. Uh, I can talk while I'm working. These pots, small bowls, which I'm going to start with, are the thing which I usually start by making. Small, general uh, utility bowls. Have you always used a kick wheel, Warren? Yes, yes. Uh, we got used to this wheel when working here at the pottery, and uh, I think I think it's the greatest wheel ever. Uh, you know, because it's the one I'm used to. Yes, we uh, we took two leech wheels home with us when we when we left the pottery. In the small group of pots. Uh, uh, got here, you'll see s several with uh, a double rim on them. Um, that's something I developed uh, again as a slight decorative device. It doesn't improve the use of the pot, but it makes it a little more interesting to look at. But I also found out, having having developed this rim, that it's really boring to see two circles running parallel, and so I'm, I'm more inclined to. Uh, uh, bring them together in some manner. Uh, you can divide it like that for two or three or four or ten or whatever you want to do. Another thing that I picked up after leaving the leech pottery, we at the time we were here, we seldom uh, distorted a pot from the true round form. And uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, I find that you can take a very simple throne form and alter it in many different ways and make it, it doesn't make it function any better, but it's a little more interesting to look at. Uh, because un unless you have some sort of contrast within a pot form where you where you you have a change of rhythm in the in the way the walls are are uh, shaped or in which you have distorted it, Bernard always used to say, "A good pot reveals itself only very slowly." Um, if you make a, a round pot that's just a hemisphere. It doesn't make much sense because you know it immediately and there's nothing there to discover when you're using the pot in everyday life. I just love that philosophy of Warren's. He wanted his work to look handmade. He wanted his work to reveal itself over time to the viewer and to the user. Um, and one of the most beautiful things about Warren McKenzie was despite the fact that he was world famous, he sold his pots at a very reduced price, uh, a very humble price, because he wanted normal people to be able to buy his work. He didn't want only the richest collectors to be able to buy his pots. He wanted normal people to be able to buy his pots and not be afraid to use them. Um, so he was a beautiful, humble soul, and uh, he's greatly missed in the ceramics community. So now 
that's a little bit about the history of the potter's wheel. It's a de device that's informed by the past, but it's helping to shape artists that are leading the way into the future of ceramics. And I'm gonna tell you about a few of those new cutting edge potters that are still using this very old technology of the pottery wheel. One of them is Roberto Lugo, and I'm gonna show you a video of him in a moment. But first I'm gonna show you Lalisi Stamps. Uh, this is Lalisi, and she did a really cool project called the 100 Day Project. So her goal in this 100 Day Project was to make a mug every day. And each mug had to have a different handle. So these are just six out of the 100 pots that she made on this 100 day challenge. And this next video is going to uh, have her talking a little bit more about that project. I'm using the same clay. I'm using the same basic shape, but I'm also adding this element to it some of the handles that I make are not super functional, but it really makes you think about what constitutes as a handle. I felt like I was doing the same things over and over, and I decided that if I did 100 days worth of something, it would force me to just create something new. I think when I make pieces, sometimes I aim for this really perfect cylinder shape, or sometimes there'll be like a little hairline crack on the bottom, but it doesn't go through the whole piece. And I kind of come to terms with that. And I'm trying to overcome that idea of perfection. I didn't realize how many people would be really inspired by it. I think sometimes you do things and you don't realize how you're affecting other people. You know, you put so much time into something and building it out and having people help you and then you're there and it's so surreal to see all these people there who have supported the project from the beginning and it's one thing to get reactions from people online, but to see it in real life and to see how people interact with it was so cool. Even when I started the project, I knew that it would like be over in like a blink of an eye sure enough here i am like kind of longing for that thing that i once did but also super pumped to move forward and do new things so i love what lilisi did with that project because she took something that's been done for thousands of years, literally thousands of years, people have been making pots on the pottery wheel. And she found a fresh new approach, a way to, to make it modern, a way to challenge herself as an artist. And uh, it was a growing experience for her. And um, of course, as a modern artist, she also excels at marketing herself and making these videos. She has a presence on TikTok. She has a presence on Instagram. Um, and really is, I think, one of the, the brightest new faces in the ceramics world. So now we're gonna look at another um, new rising star in the ceramics world, Roberto Lugo. The message that I send with my art is that there's a place for us all, that we're relevant, that we matter. I'm Roberto Lugo, I'm a potter, spoken word poet, and educator. It only takes a few moments to throw a pot, but it can take days to paint that pot. I use porcelain to make my ceramic objects, because at some point porcelain is considered more expensive than gold. And as a creative person who grew up in a poor neighborhood, it feels like I'm overcoming adversity with the artwork that I make. For me, the word ghetto is synonymous with resourceful. From growing up in a place that didn't have art classes, it's a miracle that I'm here. So what I find really striking about Roberto's story is that growing up in a, a disadvantaged situation, um, discovering ceramics and discovering this passion 
that um, wouldn't normally have been something he was exposed to really, I mean, and he says this himself, it saved his life. It gave him something to live for, something to pour all his energy and his anger and his fear uh, into his work and have it be a productive outlet for the, all those emotions instead of some of the very negative outcomes that he saw happening with um, the people around him in his neighborhood. So um, he said this, he says this all the time. He has shirts and, and things made up that, that bear this slogan, pottery saved my life. And um, that's a pretty moving thing. So there's two kinds of wheel thrown forms that I want to teach you about today. There's of course many, many more than this, but these are two that I think are just very beautiful forms that I think any potter should be aware of. The first is a chawan. A chawan is a Japanese tea bowl used to make matcha tea. Matcha tea is a very bright green tea that's made from ground up um, tea leaves and uh, matcha tea needs to be stirred up with a bamboo whisk in order to have all those that tiny little um, dust of the tea really mix in with the water. So a chawan, which is a low, wide tea bowl, allows for that whisk to be able to get in there and mix up the tea. So look at the chawan shape. The walls go pretty much straight up and down, unlike our cereal bowls, which have a more curved shape to them. These walls go pretty much straight up and down. The walls might bulge a little bit out or bulge a little bit in, and they have a narrow foot at the bottom. This is the second type of form I want you to know, and that is you know me. A you know me is a tall, handleless teacup used to drink green tea. Now you would think that if you're holding on to a teacup that doesn't have a handle, you would burn your hand because the hot tea would heat up the cup and it would be too hot to hold on to. But green tea is best at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so the cup doesn't get hot enough to actually burn your hand. So you're holding your you know me in your right hand, your left hand is underneath it for stability, and you drink your lovely green tea. Now look at the shape of the you know me. The walls, again, go pretty much straight up and down. They can bulge out a little, they can bulge in a little for a little bit of personality, a little bit of um, echoing nature and how uh, organic forms kind of bulge in or, or come uh, out. Uh, but again, they have a narrow foot, a little uh, ring at the bottom that makes them seem like they're floating. <laughs> 